Okay, for those of you who are still here, um, sorry about the technical difficulties. You know, um, the gremlins are out and uh, we've been bitten. So we're back and, um, you know, ready to do the, ready to do this um, webinar. So, let's see this now. All right. There is a pandemic. A pandemic is basically an epidemic, but at global proportions um, and the issue is estrogen dominance it's a silent pandemic it's something that's going on that um, most women who are suffering from it and it's a high percentage of women who suffer from estrogen dominance related diseases they do not really speak about it or it's been a silent subject where women have been suffering in silence and you know, just to quickly give you a brief history without going on, you know, waffling on for too long. Um, myself and Dr. Amon, we've been doing AMA Health and we we had been seeing many patients with um, different ailments. But we found every time we spoke to women about what are their ongoing issues, we were finding fibroids endometriosis, cysts, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is PCOS. These conditions, nine times out of 10, were being reported, you know, being um, complained about, you know, I also have this, you know, whether somebody had diabetes or they had lupus or whatever um, chronic disease any of our patients were suffering from, they would all, all these women would have these um, other things going on. So we turned our attention to finding out, you know, how, you know, if it was just our patients or if this is a phenomena that is actually a thing. So we did our research and we found that this is a situation that's affecting, um, especially in the um, black community and the Latino community, it's running rampant. So this is an endocrine disorder. It's not only affecting, um, you know, the, the, the womb, it's also affecting other glands. It's affecting the thyroid gland. It affects um, the ovaries, the pancreas, the adrenal glands, the brain, you know, the hypothalamus, you know, um, the liver. So this is something which is causing a lot of damage, this estrogen dominance. Okay, so even though the title of our um, presentation is got fibroids, the actual root cause or the underlying disease or condition is estrogen dominance. This is a situation that is affecting, um, you know, and causing so many diseases. So we're gonna outline those and go into, you know, um, everything about estrogen dominance. So, there are symptoms that are related with estrogen dominance that, you know, most women will say, oh, I got that, I got that. You know, if we look, water retention, breast swelling and tenderness, heavy irregular menses, fatigue, sugar cravings, weight gain, fibrocystic breasts, mood swings, uterine fibroids, low thyroid symptoms. Um, low thyroid symptoms is if you're gaining weight and you can't lose weight even if you don't eat. Nervousness, anxiety, irritability, facial flushing. Now, these are synonymous with, you know, um, women who go through PMT or whatever. These are things that they are told from when they are young. These are natural, you know, this is, this is what you have to expect with, with, um, with your periods, with your menses. These are things that you, you may or may not go through, but if, it, if you're going through with it, you know, this is normal. And we're here to tell you it isn't normal and you're probably suffering from estrogen dominance if you are suffering from any of these symptoms. Now, there are diseases which are synonymous with estrogen dominance. Again, fibroids, uterine fibroids is one of them, most probably one of the most common. Um, weight gain, fibrocystic breast disease, certain types of PMS, which we just went over, migraines, menstrual disturbances, irregular and heavy bleeding, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, 
breast cancer, which, you know, this is a, you know, a deadly form of estrogen dominance, and polycystic ovary syndrome. All right? So, this, these are other symptoms that we haven't covered. Accelerated aging. All right? Because estrogen is a um, catabolic steroid. Catabolic means that it breaks you down. It pulls you apart. As, a, um, as opposed to being an anabolic steroid, which builds you up. So through life, we hear about athletes using anabolic steroids because they want their performance to be better. So the opposite of high performance is lower performance. And when it comes to your body, aging is a form of deterioration. It's letting you know that your cells are dying faster than they are being um, reproduced. Okay, so autoimmune diseases. These are your lupus, your multiple sclerosis, diabetes, arthritis, gout, you know, diseases in which um, your so-called immune system attacks you and starts devouring you. Cervical dysplasia, depression with anxiety, foggy thinking, memory loss, low blood sugar, mood swings, polycystic ovaries, allergies, asthma, cancers, breast, uterine, and prostate. And prostate is men, obviously. You know, so estrogen dominance not only affects women, it also affects men. Cold hands and feet, fatigue, hair loss, infertility, osteoporosis, slow metabolism, um, fibroids in the breast and in the uterine, um, decreased sex drive, weight gain, headaches, irregular periods, insomnia, and bloating. So these are symptoms that if you are experiencing these symptoms there's a high high chance that you have estrogen dominance this is the root cause and remember what we're saying here root cause this is the main reason for your problems is this estrogen let's not think estrogen dominance is a condition that you might you know haphazardly come across this is a situation that is rooted in your lifestyle of living and it has devastating consequences. Okay, so what causes estrogen dominance? Okay, the main thing is your diet. We have been provided with a particular type of diet here in um, North America and it's called the Standard American Diet. And there's a food pyramid that we all, you know, some point in our lives, whether it was for a day at school or two days, or you've seen it on TV and documentaries or whatever, there's a food pyramid which has all these different foods, meats, grains, dairy, you know, um, fruit and veg. And, it, you know, we're, we're shown this pyramid and this is the foods we're supposed to be eating while we're um you know, growing and part of our everyday dietary practices. The problem is most of the foods represented in this food pyramid are actually bad for us. They're actually detrimental to our health. And these foods are all meats. That's every single type of meat that you can think of, right? Whether it's fish, because a lot of people seem to think fish ain't a meat. It's like, don't eat any meat, all right? Is fish okay? No, fish is a meat, so don't eat any meat. Turkey, chicken, you know, a lot of people, again, when it comes to poultry, they think poultry ain't meat. The only types of meat are, you know, the cow and the pig, beef and, and pork. No, anything from any animal, no matter what the size of that animal is, whether it's microscopic or it's, you know, larger than a human, makes no difference. All meats are bad. Dairy, again, dairy is supposed to be for cows to feed calves right milk we're not supposed to um ingest milk which is why most of us are lactose intolerant okay um soy soy is terrible a lot of people give up meat and they start eating soy as a replacement soy is high in what we call phytoestrogens very high and wreaks havoc in your body, especially in high proportions, okay? Caffeine and alcohol, 
terrible. Okay, fast foods, McDonald's, Burger King. I'm I'm calling out names. You know, um, Zaxby's. No matter you know, Zach. People think Zaxby's is higher quality. You know, I'm going to Zaxby's. I'm going upmarket. Terrible. Still a fast food. Chinese, when you're Chinese and you're, you know, getting Chinese, you know, um, it's a fast food, you know, um, have to leave it alone, or, or, you know, and there's other, other reasons, the MSG and whatever, all right? Prescription drugs, and in particular, contraceptive pills and hormone replacement therapy. Now, let's just go to contraceptive pills just for a quick second. Here's what's going on. And it's probably happened to you if you're suffering from fibroids or endometriosis or PCOS. I'm about, I'm about to tell you your story, what happened to you. So as a teenager, you started your menses, you started your periods. And you may have been irregular. Like some months you bled and you may have spotted. And then some months you didn't bleed or spot. You just had a month where you went without a period. So... You got worried. You went to see your your um your OBGYN or GYN or your you know your general practitioner, and they said, okay, for us to regulate the cycle, we're gonna put you on contraceptive pills because it's gonna help you to bleed and you know it's gonna get your um you know your your womb into a routine. That contraceptive pill is based in estrogen. Estrogen causes estrogen dominance, okay? So what this has done through you being prescribing something, even if you wasn't having sex, you were prescribed a contraceptive pill, and this contraceptive pill contained estrogen. So by the time you reach a certain age, you have all these symptoms. You start to bloat. You start to have cramps. You start to, you know, um, see cysts developing. Some of you have PCOS, some of you started growing facial hairs, you know, some of you develop fibroids. Now, fibroids and other estrogen dominance diseases, these have been historically um, put on, you know, suffered by women of around, say, 35 to the age of menopause. It hasn't been a phenomenon that has been occurring in females, women who are in their late teens or in their early 20s. But because of the whole contraception being, you know, contraceptive pill being prescribed to these young girls, it's broken them down earlier. So now we have women with full-blown fibroids, um, endometriosis, um, causing them issues where there's, you know, so much suffering and it's happening at such an early age. And infertility is becoming a major issue you know especially among black women black women never used to have any infertility issues you sneeze on them they got pregnant all of a sudden now they're trying for babies you know women trying for babies and it's like this is unheard of you know hormone replacement therapy this usually happens after menopause you know or hist you know some women have hysterectomies some women go through menopause now they're given hormone replacement therapy to replace the estrogen and progesterone. Um, and this is causing issues with estrogen dominance. Uh, pesticides. Now, there are many different pesticides on the foods that we, you know, farmers across the world, they're using these pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, you know, and these are organochlorine pesticides. Um, DDT is one of an example, which back in the day, during the late 60s, you saw these films, short films where they were spraying them on families, on women, sitting on a beach and whatever, and they were spraying them and saying it's harmless. They come to find out it was devastating and they banned DDT. But the bad thing about it, once released into the atmosphere, it's still present. And this is the thing, ketone, um, methyl, methoxychlor, um, endosulfan, tox, paffine, um, dieldrin, hydroxyphenyl um, trichlorothane. All of these um, are just examples of pesticides and they're in the atmosphere. The moment they are sprayed on crops, they become airborne and we don't have a choice. We're breathing it in. And because we're breathing it in, we're catching 
<laughs> you know, extra estrogen. You know, what we call xenoestrogens. They're, they're coming in from the outside and they're causing devastation. Now, all plastics, back in the day, um, you know, we all, we've all, most of us have eaten meat, you know, and, and you know, um, been drinking um, Coca-Cola and stuff like that most of our lives. If you remember back in the day, if you bought a, a, a bottle of Coke, it was made of glass. If you went in, to a butcher's or, you know, to a delicatessen, a deli, and bought meat, it was put into paper, into a paper bag, whatever. Now everything's wrapped in plastic. Everything's plastic, plastic. And there's a recent discovery of a substance called BPA, um, bisphenol A, which is high in estrogens. It has properties which mimic estrogen and is causing devastation. And this is present in, you know, 99% of all plastics. Now you have non-BPA plastics, but whether they are non-BPA really or not, that's something um, that remains to be seen. Okay. Now, what causes ED? There are three estrogen types in particular, which are estrone, which is known as E1, estradiol, which is known as E2, and estriol, which is known as E3. Okay? Now, there's a, an enzyme called aromatase, which inflicts a system known as, or a process known as aromatization in your body. This is the mutation of progesterone to estrogen. It's the mutation of testosterone to estrogen and the mutation of other androgens to estrogen. All right. So estrogen, you've been taught, is a natural hormone which the body needs and it's um, key for the, um, the formation and uh, you know, the generation of female reproductive organs and is key in pregnancy and whatever. Our stance at AMA Health is that estrogen is a mutate uh, a mutation of these other anabolic steroids, steroidal hormones, natural hormones, progesterone, which is the true female hormone, and I'm going to say that again. Progesterone is the true female hormone. Okay, testosterone, which is synonymous with men, but we have both, you know, men and women both have progesterone and testosterone, all right? Um, these are the natural hormones and the other um, androgens. Now, estrogen is a result of aromatization. The mutation from this um, enzyme aromatase to convert these natural hormones into estrogen which then becomes a catabolic steroid, which breaks you down, which degenerates you, okay? Xenoestrogen ingestion, and um, this is caused by um, pesticides, again, pollution, you know, um, plastics, you know, um, hair products, um, all petrochemical um, products that we put onto our skin, may have it in our shampoo, whatever. These are all forms of xenoestrogen, okay? Once we um, ingest these xenoestrogens, they go to work on us. They start breaking us down, okay? Now, is estrogen a natural hormone or an enzymic spore? So I'm gonna read through this with you so that you can start to get an idea of what's going on. Excess estrogen not only causes cancer, breast ovarian endometrial but also raises the glycogen levels in the vagina and glycogen is the food supply for yeast now a lot of women suffer from bv or yeast infections and they don't understand the connection between yeast infections and estrogen well here you have it all right bad pms symptoms are proportionate to high estrogen levels so everything you've learned about PMS in your life that, oh, you know, you know, um, your husband says, man, I ain't going nowhere near you when you're on your period. And you're like, I'm just PMSing, I'm just PMSing. Now you know the reason, reason why. When you've been told, oh, you're just hormonal and whatever, you know that it's not a natural hormone. 
This is not, you know, this is a condition. It's a disease. So when you're PMSing, it's a disease. It's not natural. It's not, it's not normal. Okay? Um, estrogen, they are steroidal. And as such, readily diffuse across the cell membrane. Right? Which means it absorbs into the cell membrane. Once inside the cell, they bind to and activate estrogen receptors, which in turn modulate or mutate the expression of many genes and therefore the cells. So this is actually mutating your gene expression. It's modifying your DNA. This is what estrogen is doing inside your body. And when it's inside the cell, estrogen inhibits the mitochondrial spin in the affected cell. What does that mean? All right, so mitochondria is the, you know, mitochondria is the engine, is the health of the cell, it's the engine, it gives the cell its energy, right? So when mitochondria is inhibited, the spin of the mitochondria, it affects the ATP and ADP tra um, transference, right? Um, this is what gives you energy, which causes you, which gives you strength, and vitality this is the charge of your cell the health of your cell estrogen disrupts that and causes the child the, your cell to lose charge and basically start to die all right estradiol affects target tissues by interacting with two nuclear hormone receptors called estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta once the hormone binds to the estrogen receptors the hormone receptor complexes then binds to specific DNA sequences causing damage to the DNA and an increase in cell division and DNA replication. Eukaryotic cells respond to, by, to damaged DNA by stimulating or impairing specific phases of the cell cycle to initiate DNA repair. As a result, cellular transformation and cancer cell proliferation occurs. So just to quickly recap, the DNA sequencing in your body is disrupted. It causes damage to your DNA, and then the cell division of this damaged DNA starts to proliferate. So you start to have cell and DNA division and um, multiplication, all right, on damaged cells. And more often than not, these cells are what we call cancer cells, all right? and they spread and that's a no-no all right so estrogen on the stance of ama health is not a natural hormone the natural female hormone is progesterone okay now there's a big hoo-ha and debate going on within the um the world of the, um, endocrinologists about the origin and the purpose of estrogen. A whole bunch of endocrinologists are saying estrogen is normal, it's needed in the body, and then you have a whole group saying no, it's not natural, it's a carcinogen, therefore it's not natural, progesterone is the natural hormone. And this is just a comparison. This slide is a comparison of the two um, hormones. So estrogen builds up uterine lining. It increases body fat. It causes depression, headache, and migraine. It interferes with thyroid hormone. It increases blood clotting. It decreases libido. It impairs blood sugar control. It increases risk of endometrial cancer it increases risk of breast cancer now on the other hand progesterone effects maintains the uterine lining it helps use fat for energy it is an antidepressant it facilitates thyroid hormone action normalizes blood clotting restores libido regulates blood sugar levels protects from endometrial cancer and it is the probable prevention of breast cancer so those comparisons there, you see which one, which side we're on, which side I'm on, which side you should be on. And this is the way how hormones should be in your body. 
Now, seizures and epilepsy. There's a whole bunch of people who suffer from seizures and have epileptic fits. There's been, you know, there's been few connections with estrogen. But here's what's going on in your body. Again, estrogens make nerve cells more excitable. What, what is that? That's an excitotoxin. Estrogen is an excitotoxin. Okay? Increased level of estrogens lead to the increase in seizure frequency and severity. Progesterone, and especially its metabolites, on the other hand, calms nerve cells down. So, again, with progesterone as opposed to estrogen, progesterone calms the nerve cells down. Progesterone works as a natural anti-seizure agent. Okay? Alternating pattern of rising and dropping levels of estrogen through the menstrual cycle is responsible for a catamenial epilepsy phenomenon. All right, this is causing seizures. Estrogen is wreaking havoc. So we're giving all these examples to show you just what is going on or what is caused by estrogen in the body. All right, and it's not good. It's terrible. Aromatase. So let's talk a little about what aromatase is. It's also called estrogen synthetase and estrogen synthase, an enzyme responsible for a key step in the biosynthesis of estrogens. It's responsible for the aromatization of androgens into estrogens. Transforms androstenedione, sorry, <laughs> androstenedione to estrone and testosterone to estradiol E2. It's found in the tissue of endometriosis uterine fibroids, breast cancer, and endometrial cancer. And it also inhibits the spin of mitochondria. So these are the devastating effects that aromatase have on your body. All right? So we're just giving you, uh, you know, an overview education of what's going on in your body with this enzyme. How it's devastating your body. So you have, a, you know, an insight into what's going on. So, uterine fibroids, for those of you who suffer from uterine fibroids, you may have had a, um, a mini education from your GYNs and your general practitioners. There are um, four different types of, or three different types of um, fibroids, right, which is submuco submucosal fibroids, which grow just underneath the uterine lining, right, which is on the inside of the um, endometrius. The intramural fibroids grow in between the muscles of the uterus. And then we have subserosal fibroids which grow outside of the uterus. Okay? And then we have pedunculated um, fibroids which are the fibroids which hang from, you know, um, hang from tissue and they grow and they're very, very painful. Okay, um, all of these different types of fibroids have their own symptoms. Sometimes fibroids are asymptomatic, which means you don't even know they're there. You don't know they are there until you have an ultrasound or something, and then you go through that shock, like, wow, that's what's growing inside me? Yes, that's what's growing inside you. So um, if you are symptomatic, we suggest that the earlier you, you know, um, you have you tackle this issue is the better okay don't leave it do not put it off because they will grow and as they grow they can start to affect other organs in your body such as your kidneys and your liver and then you know um then you're in a panic situation and then you're forced into surgery into a surgical situation which you do not have to go through okay and that's the whole purpose of what we're dealing with here is the whole situation of you do not need surgery you don't need to get myomectomy, you don't need to get hysterectomy. We have a natural way of eliminating and getting rid of your fibroids without surgery. Okay, aromatase and endometriosis. Alright, so aromatase P450 
right? Which is, you know, there's different types of aromatase as with anything, but this P450 is the key enzyme for the biosynthesis of estrogen, which is an essential hormone for the establishment and growth of endometriosis. There is no detectable aromatase enzyme activity in normal endometrium because estrogen is not locally produced in the endometrium. Okay? Endometrios and endometriosis tissue, however, contains very high levels of aromatase enzyme, which leads to production of significant quantities of estrogen. So, when you have endometriosis now, that's when the endometri um, endometrium is going to start producing large quantities of estrogen, okay? One of the best known mediators of inflammation and pain, prostaglandin E2, strikingly induces aromatase enzyme activity and formation of local estrogen in, endometrios in endometriosis tissue. Okay. Additionally, estrogen itself stimulates cyclooxygenase 2 and therefore increases the formation of prostaglandin E2 in endometriosis. So this is, you know, we know, and I know that these are terms you probably never heard of before in your life. And you're like, all right, these are some words. This guy's using some words here. The reason why we've given you these words is so that you can Google them. You can put them in your search engine and you can Google them and find out what these um, hormones, peptides, chemicals, what they're doing in your body, all right? So, you know, Google while I have the screen on. I'm about to change it now, so if you haven't done it before, lesson to be learned for the next time you see a big word. Okay, polycystic ovaries, ovarian syndrome, PCOS. PCOS is probably the most frequent or most um, suffered issue amongst women of childbearing age. Even though fibroids is the, is the disease that is out there and you know um, is being spoken about the most, PCOS is the most prevalent. So polycystic ovary syndrome is a disorder involving infrequent or prolonged menstrual periods or excess male hormone androgen levels. The ovaries develop numerous small collections of fluid called follicles and may fail to release eggs. PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder among women between the ages of 18 and 44. And what goes on, this is just a, just a you know, a, 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 you try to do a simplified um, diagram of what's going on in your body. All right, um, with PCOS. So we have the hypothalamus, which produces gonadotropin releasing hormone, which goes into the anti, um, anterior pit pituitary gland to produce FSH and luteinizing hormone. Now, what happens is through estrogen and estrogen dominance, the anterior pituitary gland does not produce enough follicle stimulating hormone which in turn will stimulate granulose cells, all right? These granulosa cells help with ovulation. There's a lack of these granulosa cells because of the lack of um, insufficient production of follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH. So what this does is there's an over amount of theca cells in the ovaries. These theca cells produce androgens. These androgens are then converted into estrogen by aromatization. So we get what we know as a negative feedback. They go to the anterior, anterior pituitary gland and again this causes a reduction in follicle stimulating hormone. So this continuous level of estrogen causes abnormal feedback regulation of gonadotropin secretion such that luteinizing hormone, LH, secretion continues to be high relative to FSH secretion. Here comes another problem. Insulin resistance leads to hyperinsulinemia, um, 
which contributes to the problem because insulin stimulates ovarian androgen production. So we have this ever decreasing circle or ever amplifying issue of hormonal imbalance and endocrine disruption. So it's a major issue and PCOS is on the rise. There's more women and one of the main devastations of PCOS is infertility. Infertility is on the rise, especially in the black community and the Latino community. Never was an issue before, all of a sudden it is. This is all due to aromatization and the foods you've been eating. Oral contraceptives. All contraceptive pills contain estrogen, ethanol, estrogen, estrogel, and mestronol, although in varying amounts, and one of, the, of a number of different um, progestogens, okay? They are usually taken for 21 days with a seven-day gap during which a withdrawal bleed, often but incorrectly referred to as a menstrual period, occurs. In untreated PCOS, the uterus experiences unopposed estrogen. Estrogen stimulates endometrial proliferation, while high levels of progesterone, as occurred during the luteal phase, will stop proliferation and promote endometrial secretion. Long stretches of unopposed estrogen will promote too much endometrial proliferation, causing the woman to have menorrhagia, excessive menstrual um, bleeding. Constant stimulation of endometrial proliferation as occurs in PCOS also increases a woman's risk for the development of endometrial cancer. So oral contraceptives are a uh, or an are, are an absolute no no if you have you know for you ladies who are older who have daughters who are just starting their menstrual cycles who you know whether they are 13 16 17 do not repeat do not put them onto oral contraceptives this is the setup for them to have major issues which can be cancerous all right, so prevention is better than cure. All right, so we absolutely forbid, <laughs> you know, we, we, we give people advice about what foods they should eat and what food they shouldn't eat. But we say absolutely we forbid that you consume soy. There's a lot of so-called, you know, conscious and um communities out there and organizations who actually will say no there's nothing wrong with soy well we're here to tell you soy is very dangerous soy danger number one phytoestrogens estrogen from plants which mimics estrogen in the body leads to estrogen dominance soy danger number two goitrogenic is goitrogenic what is this? Soy is the king of thyroid suppressant foods. Let me repeat that. Soy is the king of thyroid suppressant foods. It suppresses your thyroid. This is what's responsible for hypothyroidism. All you ladies that, you know, you used to be slim, slender, athletic and whatever, and one day you just started putting on weight, you're like, what's going on? You started putting on fat, what's going on? You can't lose it. All right, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to cut down what I'm eating. Weight's still go, getting on you because your thyroid is inactive. All right? These thyroid suppressive foods, it inhibits the amount of iodine supplied to thyroid. Okay? So estrogen is an anti-iodine food. All right? This leads to fatigue, weight gain increases sensitivity to cold, increases mood swings, okay? Soy danger number three, phytates, phytic acids. These are enzyme inhibitors that block mineral absorption in human digestive tract. One of these minerals that a lot of you know of is iron. Iron being inhibited in the body leads to anemia. A lot of women 
are anemic. They suffer from anemia, okay? This is one of the foods that you make sure you leave out if you are anemic because with this food, you ain't absorbing any iron. This is naturally found in grains. These phytates are naturally found in grains, seed, nuts, and legumes. Soy is extremely high in phytates. So in Asian countries, they ferment this soy as a remedy for this. But we are opposed to fermentation and we're opposed to soy, so leave them both out. Soy danger number four. Trypsin or trypsin inhibitors. Trypsin is a digestive enzyme we need to properly digest protein. Without enough trypsin, there will be excessive digestive problems. Stomach cramps, diarrhea, bleeding, and eventual problems with the pancreas. Now the FDA refused to approve isolated soy protein as a safe, as a safe food or additive with the designation generally recognized as safe. So even the FDA know there's a problem with soy, all right? They will not give it a pass or give it a stamp of approval, all right? So it's not generally, and this is the soy protein isolate that you get in a lot of these so-called vegan protein shakes. So always read the label. And if, if you have a protein, you know, a vegan or vegetarian protein shake or protein smoothie mix or whatever, Check it out right now to see if it's got soy protein isolate. If it does, throw it in the trash immediately. Okay, so here are other foods that are rich in estrogen, okay? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to have a look at this list and to be flabbergasted and be like, wow, oh my days, I don't believe it. And this is for men and women. Because men are also being, you know catching issues with from estrogen dom dominance, like balding, prostate issues, erectile dysfunction. So, you know, this ain't just about the women, you know, we're going to give the men a breakdown as well. But these are the fruits that are rich in estrogen when they are grown without, you know, when they're not organic. This is foods that are grown conventionally with pesticides, herbicides and fungicides. These are the foods that are really bad, all right? Apples, and these are also, if they're organic and they're not, you know, on our good food eat list, okay? Apples, cherries, plums, beets, carrots, yes, carrots. Cucumbers, yes, cucumbers. Cucumbers are high in phytoestrogens. Carrots, high phytoestrogens. Beets, high in phytoestrogens. These particular grains, barley, rice, and wheat. So everything that you probably have, been eating for breakfast since you've been a child growing up and the staple diet of rice you know if you're latino and you like rice and beans if you're you know west indian jamaican and you like your rice and peas on a sunday and most of the foods you eat is always rice and chicken rice and this rice and that terrible those of us who've been eating bread all our lives toast for breakfast you know sandwiches during the day wheat is high in estrogen seeds flax seeds now, this whole phenomenon of omega-3 and 6s and whatever, and what foods are high in omega, which is brain food and whatever, flax is one of the foods that are pushed out there, flax seeds. Flax is not good at all. It's one of the foods that's, um, they use, one of the chemicals from flax seeds is rat poisoning, okay? But flax seeds, high in estrogen. Sunflower seeds, they are high in estrogen. So a lot of men, a lot of men who, um, since they were boys eating sunflower seeds that they buy from the gas station, been eating these sunflower seeds, and guess what happened? Low sperm count, very low sperm count when they get older, all right? Fennel seeds, high in estrogen. Garlic, garlic is something, do not eat garlic, especially raw garlic, do not have it in your food. A lot of people spice their food with garlic because it's so... Um, you know, savory. You know, garlic is, is bad for you on many different levels. You know, burns holes in your small intestines. Do not want that. Do not want the leaky gut syndrome. So leave garlic alone. It's high in phytoestrogens. Parsley and clover, high in phytoestrogens, okay? So um, I hope you've had a very long look at this slide and, 
you know, if you have this in your refrigerator or in your cupboards or whatever, you know that you need to get rid of these if you have any estrogen dominance issues or diseases. Okay, now these, this is the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. Every year, these um, lists change. Now, these are basically foods which are most affected on the Dirty Dozen. These um, are the foods which, when they are grown conventionally with pesticides and that, they are terrible. They're the worst foods for you to buy. They're high in pesticides. These pesticides are high in estrogen and other um, toxins, okay? Celery, number one. This is the worst, right? From the worst to the um, downwards. Celery, peaches, strawberries, apples, blueberries, nectarines, bell peppers, spinach, cherries, kale, collard greens, potatoes and grapes. So some of these foods here, you'll recognize them and say, well, I always thought these were good for me. Some of them are good for you if they are organic. You have to buy these. If you do buy these, you buy them organic. Some of these on this list of the dirty or dirty dozen, we do not want you to eat them, period. Whether they are organic or not. Alright? Um, and in the Fibro Elimination Bible, we have a list of um, what foods you should not eat and what foods you should eat. Alright? So the clean 15 are the foods that even if they are grown unorganically, they are you know, somewhat safe, then they they you know, the pesticides do not penetrate and get into the flesh of the particular um fruit or vegetable. Onions, avocados, sweet corn, sweet corn is a no no anyway, right? Pineapple, mangoes, sweet peas, asparagus, kiwi, cabbage, eggplant, cantaloupe, watermelon, grapefruit, sweet potatoes, honeydew melons. These are foods that even if they are not organic, they are still safe to eat, okay? Even though eggplant is on our bad list, um, and sweet corn, asparagus is touch and go, but you know, we'll allow it for now. All right, so ladies, 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 it is time for you to go natural. If you have, especially if you have estrogen dominance related diseases. Why? Because most hair relaxers, relaxers contain xenoestrogens. One in particular is known as phthalates. These things, phthalates, right, which is one of them tricky words to say, because you can see there's like four consonants in a row, which we don't know what to do with, right? But these phthalates are found in cosmetic products. And they can be absorbed by the skin or inhaled. And they have been proven to have xeno um, or highly estrogenic effects in cell models and in experimental animals. Okay. What we have here is a list of all the shampoos and hair products that contain phthalates. They're also found in perfumes, in fake fragrances, in soaps in creams, moisturizer creams. So we have a saying at AMA Health, if you can't eat it, don't put it on your skin. If you cannot eat it, do not put it in your hair. And here's another thing with, um, you know, for women who, oh, I keep my hair natural, but I just use weaves. There's a phenomena going on with, um, what's that disorder um, of hair loss? What's the disorder of hair loss? It's just blanked out my mind. What's it called? Um, alopecia, right? All these things come to my head. I've got Dr. Amon sitting next to me. He's looking at me like, oh, what, what are you talking about, mate? Alopecia. Now, alopecia is a phenomenon that's going on, especially with women who have been relaxing their hair for a long time and also putting weave into their hair. Here's the reason why. A lot of you buy weave from the store and the weave contains you know the weave is natural hair it's somebody somebody in india or in china or korea wherever south american brazilian you know you're getting this hair and it's like wow this is beautiful hair i want it to look real so you buy this hair now 
If you've ever seen um, CSI, the series. Anybody seen CSI? Ira, you seen CSI? Ira, you seen CSI? Yes. All right. Everybody loves CSI. You know that when you find DNA, they find criminals by their DNA. Here is one of those places where if you leave your hair behind, they're going to be able to match it to your DNA because your hair contains DNA. Here's what the problem is. When you're buying natural hair, that hair contains DNA. Now there's this phenomena that goes on in the body called HLA, human leukocyte antigen, where antigens, or leukocyte antigens in your body, recognize your DNA. And they leave your DNA alone, normally. They leave your DNA alone, but when there's a foreign entity of DNA in your body, they go crazy and they attack it. So when you're putting this weave into your hair, your HLA human leukocyte antigens are attacking, releasing a substance called leukotrienes, a chemical. And the leukotrienes are causing this alopecia over time, it causes inflammation, causes irritation, the itching. So all you women that have weaves and you're always itching, you know why you're itching. It's the HLA, it's the white blood cells. They're going crazy. They're releasing um, these leukotriene chemicals. They're very powerful and they're causing devastation causing you to go bald, you lose hair, okay? So, food for thought. Not only with the estrogen, but also with the activation of white blood cells in these HLAs. Okay, what happens in your body? There are three stages to what goes on in your body to develop estrogen dominance. The first stage is ingestion. The second stage, and you know, ingestion is whether you're eating something or it's absorbing into your skin or through your scalp or whatever. That's ingestion, it's getting into your body. Then there's metabolism. This is the process of your liver. Your liver has a function of deducing or, you know, finding out what's good for your body and what's bad for your body. And basically filtering out that which is bad and processing and providing to your body that which is good in nutrients and minerals and what have you. So your liver is like the brain of your, of your body, right? of your digestive system. Your liver is going to deduce what is good and what is bad. Whatever's bad is going to filter it out. Whatever's good is going to process and um, assign it to regenerate tissue and to stimulate and, you know, um, promote good health and well-being. Then there's dysfunction. The dysfunction happens when the liver breaks down in its functionality. It's overwhelmed by what's going on in your body, okay? So, after xenoestrogen ingestion, the liver becomes overworked and sluggish. The liver is responsible for metabolizing digestive foods and filtering toxins. Filtered toxins are eliminated through urea cycle, defecation, and perspiration. An overworked liver fails to, fails to metabolize and eliminate estrogen. So the estrogen enters the bloodstream. Estrogen stagnates at various organ locations and diffuses across cell membranes. Once the estrogen enters the cells, it activates and binds to estrogen receptors and disrupts and slows the mitochondrial spin. This in turn modulates or mutates the expression of many genes and therefore the cells. Cells lose their charge and appear to be foreign invading entities. This is where the white blood cells come in. Any cell in your body that is of low charge or that appears to be a foreign entity has a different appear to have a different DNA, different structure, white blood cells say, we're on. You know, they're like, let's attack. So white blood cells, which are not blood cells, they're actually spores. They're also known as leukocytes or immunoglobulins. They have their own chromosomes, their own DNA. They are shapeshifters. This means they have different names depending on where they colonize in the body. And we say colonize, right? 
they attack any entity, foreign or domestic, lacking in electric charge. They have a process called phagocytosis or erythrophagocytosis. This is when they attack red blood cells or attack cells. Phagocytosis is when they attack the cells in your body. This is known as autoimmune disease. All right. They release endogenous parogens. These are fever-inducing chemicals. And just like bacteria and viruses, um, they have exogenous pyrogens, pyrogens, okay? So they are pathogens in your body. They cause inflammation. They are internal, they, they um, have internal response to foreign um, entities. This is what <laughs> inflammation is, okay? They transport viruses and bacteria throughout the body. So white blood cells, it is AMA's, AMA Health's position, the position of the Aboriginal Medical Association, that white blood cells are not supposed to be in our bodies. And in fact, white blood cells <coughs> um, have been genetically, um, by geneticists, have um, shown that the original human genome, those of Homo sapiens sapiens, known as Africoids, never had any white blood cells as part of their genome, in their DNA, in their blood. White blood cells are part of the Neanderthal genome, which through miscegenation, racial mixing, that have entered into the body and cohabited in a you know, um, symbiotic fashion, symbiotic fashion into the black body. Okay, so I remember when I was a, when I was a child, we had um, the fire people come around, you know, firemen come to my school and they gave us this diagram, which was in order to have a fire, you need three um, criteria in order to have a fire, which was heat, fuel, and oxygen. That's going to give you fire. With fibroids, I've given a simple breakdown of what's going on in your body, which is the fibroid conducive environment. In order to have fibroids and other um, <coughs> estrogen related, um, estrogen dominance related diseases and conditions, this also applies. You need these three entities. You need, or substances, you need estrogen. You need white blood cells, and then you need blood, which these estrogen and the white blood cells travel around, um, you know, in the blood. They transport it in the blood. Even though white blood cells really don't need the blood vessels because they pierce through your blood vessels and travel wherever they want, okay? But by looking at this, we know that in order to have your fibroids or whatever, if we remove <coughs> any of these entities, any of these substances from this triangle, we can basically cut off the supply to the fibroids and reverse or shrink it. Now, in this tripod here, we don't want to cut off blood, all right? Now, there is a procedure where they do cut off that blood which is called uterine, um, uterine artery embolization or uterine fibroid embolization where they cut off the, the artery or the blood vessels that lead to the um, uterus and in turn that shrinks and the fibroids shrivel away because they don't have a blood supply. We don't want to do that. We want to keep your blood going because your blood helps to, you know, um, replenish and brings oxygen to the cells, which is the food for the cells, and um, vitality brings other hormones and other um, minerals and nutrients to that area. So we don't want to cut off the blood supply. Okay, so we concentrate on cutting off the estrogen and the white blood cells. All right. So allopathic treatments. These are treatments that. In the Western world of med medicine, these are their um, remedies for your fibroids, endometriosis, and what have you, 
right? Hysterectomy. Now, here's a snapshot of the world of the hysterectomy, and in particular the US. The US performs more hysterectomies than any other country in the world. Butchers, I tell you, butchers. Over 600,000 hysterectomies are performed in the US each year. Over 300,000 of them are due to uterine fibroids. 78% of all the US hysterectomies are performed on African American women. 78% are performed on African American women. There are 468,000 African American hysterectomies per year. Over half of them, 234,000, are due to fibroids. Hysterectomies are being largely performed for unwarranted and unnecessary reasons. So if you have fibroids and they tell you, get a hysterectomy, get a hysterectomy, they just want to line their pockets with money. It's unnecessary, which is why we are here, AMA Health. You do not need to have a hysterectomy to get rid of your fibroids. You absolutely do not need it. So there are short-term risks with hysterectomies, such as infections. These are of the bladder, chest, abdomen, um, and you may have to be hospital hospitalized in order to deal with it. Urinary problems. There are kidney and bladder infections which can occur from hysterectomies. There are blood clots. These can happen with any kind of surgery, right? Um, and they cause issues with the leg, not, you know, particularly deep vein thrombosis on the pelvis, and this can actually cause death, all right? Hemorrhage, always a risk of hemorrhage that you bleed out during surgery. We don't like this, you know, our good Dr. Sabi used to say, if we were supposed to be, people were supposed to go inside us to perform surgery, we would have been born with a zip on our chest or on our bodies. We don't have zips, so therefore, you know, we only will recommend surgery if it's life and death that you need surgery to stop from. If you've had, had an accident and there's something, you know, you've been impaled and they have to perform surgery to take whatever is out of you, all right? There are adverse reactions such as nausea and vomiting. And there's also adjacent organ perforation. There's also, you know, the most deaths in the United States are caused by surgical accidents. More deaths than your gangbangers. More deaths than road rage, car accidents, plane crashes. More deaths than any other way of having a death in this country is performed by surgical accident. 100,000 per year. 100,000 surgical related or surgical accident related deaths per year. All right? Yet these doctors are getting away with it. They're not going to jail. Some of us don't even sue them. We just accept, oh man, yeah, John is dead. Johnny died because somebody messed up. So, you know, a lot of people going for small procedures. Why not either paralyzed, dead, or some you know, lifelong chronic situation that they have to live with for the rest of their lives, all right? So don't get surgery. Long-term effects, urinary incontinence. Very embarrassing. Can't hold your urine, you know, on a bus, on a train, a car, traveling, whatever. Whoops. No, no. Early menopause. Menopause is not natural, ladies, just to let you know. I know some of you have aunties, mums, you know, whoever, sisters who, go, who are going through menopause. It's not natural. The reason for menopause is hormonal imbalance. Menopause shouldn't occur. Foods that you eat, lifestyle you're living is responsible for that, okay? But when you perform hysterectomy, know this for sure. Because hysterectomy does not get rid of the estrogen dominance. The estrogen is still wreaking havoc in your body, all right? Lack of orgasm. Say no more. Just leave that alone right there, all right? Prolapse. Intestines and bladder can 
descend towards the bottom which can lead to constipation and or urinary incontinence, inability to control bladder and pain in sexual intercourse. All right? Terrible. Mood swings. You know, us men are suffering enough already. But moods can get totally out of control. Depression, sadness due to feeling or losing your femininity. And your, your, your womb is not just there to, for childbearing. It's also there to balance your hormones. It plays an integral part in your hormonal balance. Once you get rid of it, your hormones will never, ever, ever be the same again. They're thrown into disarray. And they never can balance because a major organ is missing. You know, a three-legged stool has lost one of its legs. Always going to need something to prop it up unnaturally. Don't do it. Myomectomy. All right. So your GYN says, all right, you don't need to get a hysterectomy. Here's what you can do. We can just surgically remove those fibers, them bad boys. We can just go in and surgically remove them. Would you like that? You want to keep your womb, right? No, we don't want to see your womb go. Would you like to just get us to just get rid of them damn fibroids? All right. So there's different types of um, surgery. Um, laparoscopy, which is keyhole, and laparotomy, which is opening the abdomen. Right? Again, if we were supposed to have surgery, we'd have zips on our bodies. We don't have them. Now, these GYNs, they know, right? They know what's going on. They know that it's not getting rid of the estrogen dominance. If it's not getting rid of the estrogen dominance and you still have those three criteria, which one is estrogen, the other is white blood cells, and the other is your blood flow, guess what's going to happen? It's going to come back. Most women, 99.9% .9 of women who have myomectomy and don't change their lifestyle, those fibroids come back. And when they come back, they come back with a vengeance. So these are just the risks that are synonymous with myomectomy. Excessive bleeding, which requires transfusion. Anemia due to blood loss. Adverse reactions due to anesthetics. Puncture of bowel or blood um, or, or bladder during surgery. Opening of the womb or bowel during operation. If a large fibroid is removed, the wall of the womb may be weakened, leaving a deep wound. Blood clot in legs. Again, all forms of surgery, you know, have that risk. Wound infection. Pelvic adhesion that can cause pain and or bowel blockage, which may require surgery in the future to correct this. Risk of conversion to hysterectomy. Right? Keyhole um, laparoscopic myomectomy may be converted into an open ab ab abdominal procedure for effectiveness and safe safety reasons. Eventual regrowth of fibroids, which is going to happen, ladies. If you have a myomectomy, they will return. All right? Five to ten years, and, and right now it's even more frequent. Women who have had um, myomectomies, within two years, they're coming back. Then they go back, and guess who's quids in? Going to the bank, in the pink. Going to the bank is your GYN, who's performing the surgery. All right? Possible heart attack due to strain on the heart. Death due to severe complications during the off or after the operation. So there's always... um risks when it comes to surgery and this specific risk was laparoscopic um surgery damage to the bowel bladder and blood vessels may occur due to the laparoscopic technique itself if this happens you will need open abdominal surgery to correct the damage very rarely if this damage is not recognized at the time of surgery later surgery will be necessary okay so all of these um, situations are not good, just to let you know the risks. Again, we spoke about uterine fibroid embolization, right, earlier on, where they cut off the blood supply, right? They um, use a catheter and they um, put small particles, um, plastic or polymer, 
particles to block the uterine artery and it blocks the supply to the uterine body all right and this is performed by a uh, interventional radiologist all right so a third party has to perform this cutting off the blood supply will cut off the estrogen because estrogen travels in the blood so the fibers then shrink all right now what are the risks death from embolism those small particle balls that they use can travel and they cause you know um could be pulmon pulmonary embolism where your lungs get blocked um, arteries in your lungs get blocked and um your lungs go through a process called infarction where it dies and then you know you die death from septicemia presence of pus forming or other pathogenic organisms or their toxins in the blood or tissues this results in multiple organ failure so you went in there with a benign condition fibroids and you ended up with multiple organ failure all right now ufe is a procedure which you know oh you know it's becoming very popular why because you've got, you're an outpatient you go in you have the procedure it takes an hour or so and then you're out back to work you know you tell your boss oh i'm leaving you know i'll be back you know i'm taking an extra lunch break you know uh, an extended lunch break you could be back there within a couple of hours but these are the risks infection from tissue death of fibroids leading to endometri um, endometritis misembolization from microspheres these particles they can travel around your body drift into other tissues cause severe damage ovarian damage embolic material migrating to the ovaries all right this is pieces of material traveling elsewhere loss of ovarian function infertility loss of orgasm these are major loss of ovarian function infertility loss of orgasm now you're not enjoying the sex anymore you're not enjoying it he knows you're not enjoying it you can only fake for, for so long all right post embolization syndrome acute chronic pain up to 102 degree temperatures nausea vomiting okay not nice not nice at all infertility now here's one of the most devastating things about this procedure you might get pregnant you might carry a child for five months four five six months and then you suffer late-term miscarriage and that's so devastating on so many levels on on you know the whole emotional level that you carry the child and then that child dies so this is letting you know these are the allopathic western answers to your fibroids they're not good. We do not recommend any of them. This is the AMA health remedy. As you can see, there's a few books here for education because you need to know what's going on in your body. You need to know what you can eat, what you should put into your body. You need to supplement, okay? With these, with this right here, this is all you need to get rid of your fibroids to get rid of your endometriosis, to get rid of your PCOS. You don't need surgery. You don't need to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars and then have to may, may have to go back in a, in a year or so because they've come back. This is the remedy to cut it off at the root source. The root cause of all those diseases is estrogen. And our remedy consists of the following all right we have a five point remedy of ama health diet you have to eliminate certain foods from your diet you have to include certain foods in your diet all right in the fibroid elimination bible which is this black book with the pink writing and the nice gold 
Caduceus, all right, has a list of foods that you have to cut out of your diet. You must cut these foods out. Then we have a list of foods that you can replace those foods which you cut out with these particular foods. We have the um, transitional diet meal plan, which is how to transition into being becoming vegan. Then we have the elimination, the, um, the elimination, which is how what foods you have to eat while you're trying, you know, while we're going through the elimination phase. Then we have regeneration. You know, which we'll touch on while we go through um, your Q and A. Regeneration. Once you go through elimination, we want to regenerate and grow any muscle, any cells which may have atrophied while you're, you know, starving out the um, those fibroids. Exercise, absolutely essential, absolutely necessary. This is how you get your lymph. Flowing. This is how you generate electricity, electromagnetism in your body. You need weight training, resistant training, which is weights or calisthenics. Absolutely necessary. Qigong, breathing, aerobic exercises, which help to um, unblock meridians. Those are um, energy pathways of your body. A lot of those become stagnant, blocked, because you're not active. Lifestyle, the lifestyle that you've been living has been conducive to your fibroids and to your estrogen dominance. By exercise and diet, we're going to reverse that. Sleep, your melatonin cycle. Sleep is absolutely essential. This is where your body repairs itself. This is where your body does um, its best repair work is during the night. It's like, you know, you might ride the train or whatever and there's delays during the day during the night, that's when the workers get out there, they, they repair those rails and do whatever. This is what goes on in your body. Your melatonin, um, vitamin D, which is a hormone, all of these go to work to regenerate. Everything you've eaten during that day, that's good for you. All the minerals and that, this is where um, they are assimilated and made use of and they go to work to repair and regenerate tissues, okay? This happens particularly during your slow wave cycle and when you're in sleep paralysis that means you ain't moving basically dead to the world appear apparently dead to the world sleep is the sister to death and it's during this time of paralysis where your body is most effectively repairing itself getting rid of pathogens um you know replenishment rejuvenation all of these things take place during that um cycle we know, know it as the melatonin cycle, all right? Sun. Most of us around the world, there's this phenomenon known as AC, air conditioning. When it's hot outside, oh man, whoo, whoo, ha, I'm going inside, I can't take the sun, you go inside. What's the result? You have a lack in vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency, vitamin D is what repairs your body. Vitamin D is responsible for um, preventing cancer. All kinds of illnesses that we suffer from, vitamin D is down to vitamin D deficiency, in particular vitamin D3. What we get from the sun is UVB. There's different radiation that's kicked out from the sun. But there's a particular radiation which is known as UVB, which is what is healthy for us. It helps to regenerate, rejuvenate. It is a source of um, energy and food for us. It's actual food, right? Now we need, as especially as um, melanated people, black people, we need between one and two hours of UVB per day, per day. All right, every day we have to be getting one to two hours. Most of us get 10 minutes per day because we're always inside. The way how we live is, you know, you drive to work, you get out of your car and you go into your job and you're there during the day. You get an hour for lunch, but you spend that, 
you know, traveling again, if you go outside or if you have a cafeteria inside, and then it's back to work. So the times when UVBR is most active is between 11 in the morning and four in the afternoon during the summer. A lot of places in the United States during the winter, there is no UVB, zero UVB. And this is between like October and March. There is zero UVB. People in the, in the tropics, like in the Caribbean, in Africa and that, there's UVB all year round. But for us in North America and in Europe, outside in the temperate zones, during the winter time, we do not get any UVB. In Georgia, we may get a little for a couple hours. All right? Supplementation. The Earth's um, soil, the mineral content of the soil is depleting. It is fast depleting every year. Okay? All our minerals and nutrients and the goes into the plants because the soil is depleting in its mineral content and nutrient content the foods that we buy and eat they are lacking in the nutrients and the minerals that we need so we need to supplement supplementation is what you find and herbs and spices is where these nutrients and minerals are the, are the most potent and this is why we produce our natural herbal supplements. All right. So these five points, these are the five criteria you need for optimum health. That supplementation is very, very important. Okay. So the Fiber Elimination Bible is a concise, non, no nonsense, best, best selling instructional manual that has been composed as a result of years of dietary research and clinical trials which has led to the development of an infallible process that can actually totally eliminate uterine fibroids in as little as 40 days so we've been studying this for a long time and we've developed a process a procedure that is infallible it works it has to work all right we put it all into this book got fiber is the fiber elimination bible so your education is key okay and this book has the procedure that education what you need the meal plan um ama meal plans again the transition meal plan um while you're weaning yourself off your bad foods the transition meal plan is is absolutely essential then we have the elimination phase which is around 42 days so we have 30 days worth of meals three meals that's 90 recipes all right that you go through in elimination all right then we have regeneration that is the rebuilding of your tissues that may have been damaged through um, endometriosis, through PCOS, through fibroids, whatever. You know, some of you may have had surgery before and have scar tissue and what have you. And the regeneration meal plan is to help um, regenerate damaged tissue, um, cells, muscles, which may have atrophied, okay? So these are absolutely essential. We have our herbal supplements. We also call them elixirs. All right, herbal elixirs. Essence of fertility, very, very powerful formula. It inhibits aromatase and estrogen. Remember that diagram of estrogen being one of the components? If you have fibroids or endometriosis or PCOS or cysts, estrogen is the root cause. By inhibiting estrogen and aromatization, we've eliminated the problem it promotes correct progesterone production which is hormone balance it provides correct copper to zinc balance right amplifies libido and neutralizes sexually transmitted microbes now with essence of fertility we actually originally developed this formula for um libido 
and STDs. That was our original and for fertility. We developed it further to inhibit the aromatase and estrogen, which now it's like an all-in-one. Females have to have this. Even if you don't have fibroids or endometriosis or whatever, you need this because um, the fertility rate every year, you know, you've got the World Health Organization, every decade they release um, fertility rates and whatever. And the fertility rate has actually fallen to its lowest in history. I mean, it's been decreasing. But it used to be, you know, at like 85%. Now it's like at 45%. It's very low. So, and that's because of the um, depletion of the minerals in the soil and whatever. So, essence of fertility, you need it. Even if you do not suffer from any of these, because you have to supplement. Rigid ease. This is a liver detoxifier. The liver is key. The liver plays such an important role in your body as we, um, as we exhibited earlier on. Your liver discerns between what's good for you, what's a toxin or pathogen, what's toxic to you, and what's good for you. And it either metabolizes and filters it out, flushes it out to be put out by your um, excretory system or through your um, respiratory system, or through you sweating, right? Um, persp perspiration, all right? But your liver does that job. Rigidies restores the liver's functionality. It eliminates tumors and inflammation, all right? So it inhibits white blood cell action, all right? It regenerates cells and organs. Right, so it's going to help to rebuild cells that may have been damaged or organs which may have, you know, been damaged through whatever um, situation. It eliminates cramping because cramping is the result of inflammation. All right, it activates and restores energy by it regenerating cells and organs and tissues. You're going to have, uh, you know, um, energy level is going to go through the through the roof and it reverses aging. So again, aging is a result of your cells dying faster than they're being reproduced. So when we replenish cells and we're getting them to reproduce faster than they're dying, you reverse aging. Phoenix. Phoenix generates and charges red blood cells. Red blood cells are essential to carry oxygen around your body and electricity. That oxygen is the electricity being carried around your body. It neutralizes microbes in the blood, any impurities. It charges the lymphatic system, your lymph. The lymph is what helps to flush impurities out of cells and carry them out to be urinated or um, perspirated out. It clears your skin. It's, very, it's excellent for rashes and what have you. All right? Neutralizes virulence. It gets rid of um, virus in your body and it neutralizes white blood cells. Remember that diagram. White blood cells are an issue. White blood, blood cells shouldn't be in the body. All right? We're going to inhibit and neutralize those white blood cells. So we're going to get rid of the estrogen and the white blood cells. That's how we're going to get rid of your fibers, how we're going to get rid of endometriosis, PCOS, cysts and all the other issues, all right? Cancer too, cancer too, just to make that clear, all right? So this package is also um, to eliminate and to reverse cancer, okay? All right, so we have all of these being sold on our website, fibroidelimination.com, all right? Known as the Fibroid Elimination Kit. Now what we're going to do for you for the next three days, 72 hours, those of you who are watching this webinar, just for you, by applying our coupon code FEKIT100, you're going to get $100 off the fibroid elimination kit. All right? So the normal price is $350. You're going to, by applying that coupon code, 
you're going to get it for 250 This is only going to be for three days. Okay? So act fast. If you're watching and you need um, this kit, and you do need this kit if you suffer from estrogen dominance, take advantage of our discount. Okay? Um, I think that concludes, I believe, our presentation for today. So myself and Dr. Amun, we're just getting ourselves together for the camera and we'll be able to answer your um, questions that you asked during the... So how many questions do we have so far? Let's see. Well, there Great job, great job, great job. Thank you very much. Well done. So you can actually look at it, the fee if you want. Um, it's kind of sc it's scrolling up. Okay. I think they asked a few questions about uh, rice and um, a couple other things. Okay. But um. Oh, it's all up here. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. You yeah. You, you, you can read the questions so, so that. that be done. Yeah. Okay, let's see. All right, if you have any questions as well, you know, it's not too late for you to ask them. So um, we'll just go through now. Um, they were asking if, uh, about all rice. Is that all rice, including brown and basmati? Um, yes. The only rice that we recommend, and who was that question from? Uh, she's hot pink. All right, she's hot pink. Um, and these are only, you know, obviously, you know what real names make, you know? Right. I, um, the only rice that we recommend, the only good rice is wild rice. Brown rice. Wild black rice. Wild black rice, right. There's black rice, which is known as forbidden rice. No, it's still starchy. Right. All rices are starchy. Starch um, is high in nitrogen. Nitrogen affects the liver. And, and the it liver. also increases the white blood cells. Nitrogen gives birth to white blood cells. There you go. Which um, you've heard in the last 45 minutes to an hour, Dr. Amsule, um going to cry great details on how detrimental that is to our body having um high levels of white blood cells right. and someone asked about organic mung beans are they safe to eat who, who asked that charlene yeah okay. mung beans is a soya bean it's another name for soya bean so again we are dead against soya okay a lot of these foods that you're talking about and asking are also synthetic all right these grains are synthetic so they've already gone through uh, a stage of being processed so what happens is that your body doesn't know what to do with them because the process is, is, is supposed to take place when you consume natural foods, whole foods and whole foods so now the body knows how to break them down and um, process them going through different uh, stages what we're having these days is processed food already so these processed synthetic foods our body doesn't know what to do with them so they're getting deposited around different parts of the body and they turn to fat white adipose tissue to be active and those now will start leaching out parasites and fungus and different types of white blood cells and start causing havoc within the body so all of this you know um Again, when Dr. Hamster was in the early stages of the um, presentation, he was talking about these fast restaurants, you know, like Zagby's and um, Mickey D's, KFC, and that. It, we can't stress enough how dangerous this is to your health. I mean, literally, it is dangerous. It's almost like putting cocaine or heroin into your body. It's actually worse because you actually know when you put those drugs or those substances into the body what to expect okay you know um heroin fiend or crack etc but we're going every day sometimes twice a day constantly on the weekends to these fast food uh restaurants and 
even when we go to like you missed out like Red Lobster. I don't know if you said Red Lobster. I can't remember, but even though places like Red Lobster, um, Olive Gardens, a lot of these places, these are processed foods already that your body's eating and consuming, and it's very dangerous. Very, and, very. And it's what we call inflammatory foods. There you go. Because these foods, they they cause, they invoke an inflammatory response from white blood cells. The white blood cells love this. They feed off this type of food. So they release chemicals. And these chemicals, such as cytokine, histamine, TNF-alpha, they are responsible for all the pain, the bloating, the actual fibroids, Inflammation tumor is just one stage or one phase in inflammation, right? So there's, when you eat particular foods, we will let you know, like dairy is inflammatory, wheat is inflammatory, um, meats, all meats are inflammatory because they create um, or promote the, uh, um, white blood cells to go crazy. They actually like, all right, let's go, let's go. And it's that. Um, battle that there's a war that goes on in your body foreign entities come in and there's all kinds of bullets and these bullets are chemicals that these white blood cells are releasing and those in turn damage your body they leave scars you know so all the pain and discomfort that you feel you know whether it's a sharp pain or dull pain or whatever whether it's acute or chronic this is all because the white blood cells are causing inflammation in your body Okay, next question. So, uh, so I got, uh, wait, is the camera pointing? It's looking, yeah, right Okay, there. so right I look, straight, am I straight, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I got, I know, but there's another camera there, it's kind of throwing me off. A bit. <laughs> That's just monitoring, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so Saga Chama, she was asking about uh, all the milk I've been able to purchase, whether it's hemp or coconut, they have been, they have either uh, gum or rice syrup. What do you think of this, and what is the best brand so for milk? Um, I recommend you make your milk up yourself at home um, but if there is a brand um, oh man I'm trying to remember well first of all the best milks to get are either hemp milk or, or coconut, coconut milk those are the best yes, milks yeah. to buy but there's a brand that does it and they don't have those carrageenan, carrageenan. You, have to, you have to be aware of carrageenan and the additives that they put yeah natural flavors very bad for the digestive system and the liver toxin. and um, exciting toxin that actually starts damaging the brain cells so i'm trying to remember the brand though um for the coconut milk and hemp milk it'll come back to me if I, if it doesn't come back to me there's that brand um temp there's temp that's that's good but there's another particular brand that we've seen and it's just slipped my mind at the moment um, if I don't remember it before the webinar ends, just shoot me an uh, email or DM me on Instagram to remind me and I'll get that to you. Almond milk is okay, but it's not as good as coconut milk and hemp milk. Right. These are, you know, hemp milk and coconut milk, there's so many nutrients in them. What it is with almond milk is there's, what is it, arsenic? There's a slight... Slight, there's... See, uh, in, in um, almonds, almonds, but um, yeah, and now some people might say, Well, you know, what level or percentage of arsenic that is in almonds is it damaging? Like, there's um, a percentage of nicotine in eggplant. Some of them say, Well, you might have to eat 12 dozen eggplants in order for it to contain the amount of nicotine that you take from a, sing a single silver. The point that we're trying to make is that you want to have your whole foods eliminated from these chemicals whatsoever because how do you know how your body's going to react to a dose of nicotine or arsenic in it you know your body might fight it off or your body might react the opposite so we recommend that any food that we come across in our research in that has these such chemicals stay away from them when in doubt leave it out there you go all right so jo joanna she wants to she says, please touch more on having sex with fried boys. My boyfriend don't understand. <laughs> is your boyfriend listening? That's the first Yeah, is your boyfriend watching? Where was your boyfriend? Sorry. <laughs> no, I, <don't> <laughs> I mean, what is it that he doesn't understand? I mean, a lot of women that has complained because of the position of the fibroid that it is in the womb is what's causing the problem 
through the intercourse. Now, you're going to feel it. He's not feeling that in, um, that discomfort. You are. So I don't understand what he's not understanding that when you're having that intimacy and the woman is saying, I can't... Well, what, what it is... You know, is I can't this. take it because of the pain because, again, depending on where the fibroid is located... But he won't know this, and this is the problem, right, so is that the education, the suffering has been done in silence. This is, right. what, this is what the major problem is. A lot of women who have fibroids don't know they've got fibroids. They just think, oh, it's painful sex. You know, I've always had painful sex or whatever, right? But if your sex used to be comfortable before and you was enjoying it, now you're not enjoying it, um, your man ain't going to understand because you probably don't understand fibroids as a woman. He don't understand because he never, you know, a lot of men don't even know what fibroids are. They don't know what they are. There's no education. It ain't something you learn. In, you don't learn about fibroids in school. You don't learn about fibroids in college. There's no TV shows on, you know, there's no programs or documentaries out there tackling fibroids. And this is the reason why, because it affects black women. Like, black women are four to five times more likely to develop fibroids than white women. Because of that um, disparation between the two, this is why you're not seeing it on TV. If white women were suffering from it four to five times as much, they would have been, trust me, they would have been, you know, during the week, they would be like, man, another program about fibroids. So fibroids awareness has to be um, brought, um, brought into being. And, you know, that's what we're doing. We're, we're bringing this fibroid awareness into being. Like July was fibroid awareness month, just last month. Guess who was not invited to the, you know, to the awareness? We have the most um, profound, prolific um, research and pro process of eliminating fibroids. We've had so many um, successes. Everybody who uses our um, process, they all have, you know, there's different levels of success, but majority of the successes is fibroids totally gone. You know, cysts gone, cramps gone, bloating, bleeding reduced all of these things you know infertility, infertility reversed. reversed you know so we we are you know the authority the authority on this subject we've done not only have we done our research but we put it into practice and right now we're actually um destroying the fibroid world estrogen dominance we are going at it and you know we like to give the education so it's important that the educational side of it, you know, the fibroid elimination Bible has information on what, how painful each type of fibroid is. So that's something that you need to show your boyfriend that, look, this is what I got. I got this intramural fibroid, which, you know, these intramural fibroids, which are very painful during intercourse. It's the most painful type is the intramural. And so time to watch this. Well, yeah, time, time, time to, to get the book. The, so if you've got the fiber right. elimination Bible, time to read it with you. You know, both of you do research. We we recommend that any woman that is suffering with this and she's in a relationship, you know, whether it's your fiance, your husband, or your long time boyfriend, that you educate them. And this is something that you both do as a team together. Because uh -huh. you know, it's it's not just something that you should be suffering with on your own in silence. No, for too long that's happened. And this is the thing, a lot of men are insecure, so if you, if you complain that you ain't enjoying sex, he's going to be thinking, man, you've you got, you got some side, you know, <laughs> you've got some side, it, dude, it just you know, or, or you've gone off me or whatever. So the education, if he knows, all right, this is for real, all right, I understand now, it will save your um, relationship because a lot of relationships have suffered due to fibroids. So for marriage counselling, on a side note, we uh, start off at fifty dollars. And I know I'm only joking. Next question. <laughs> All right. So Regina, she was asking, where are you purchasing this wild rice, and is it a certain brand? I mean, you can get wild rice from um, farmers market. They sell it in Whole Foods. Um, we are, we are, I mean, going to say there's a particular brand because it, it it's you know you, wild rice is wild, meaning it's wild craft it, which and it's is not by nature so right. so whoever you know puts it into a packet right they right and it, and it's not actually a rice grain you know it's actually um a plant
that they refer to as uh, wild grass, but the actual leaves of the plant is so similar to rice. a rice grain. Mm -hmm. They call it, you know, black wild rice. So um, now, as long as you can get it, and remember, we always recommend that you soak it for at least 24 hours prior to cooking. And if you soak it for more than 24 hours and it sprouts, you don't even need to cook it. Yeah, you just need to warm it up. Yep. So, uh, Saga Chama, she has another question. She says she purchased the book and, and it names uh, Mama Thomas, which I cannot find on your website to purchase. Has it changed names? Has the list of changed names? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, well based Mama Tonics and Alchemy were two, um, two ellipses which we had, but we replaced and combined into one, which is now Rigides. So Rigides is the, is the replacement for Alchemy and Mama Tonics, which actually makes it easier on your pocket. So you don't have to buy four, you just need to buy three now. You know, you've got the essence of um, Fertility, Rigides and Phoenix. So, you know, we've, we've done you a great turn. Uh, uh, Sierra Strong, she asks, what's the best natural sunscreen? None. You, you don't, don't need sunscreen. sunscreen. You don't need sunscreen. We recommend you put either um, organic hemp seed oil or organic uh, coconut oil. Those are the two oils we recommend, especially in the summertime, that you apply to your skin. Again, like um, Dr. Amsu said earlier, anything that you don't consume or you can't consume in your mouth, we do not recommend you put on your hair or your body. Okay? So sunscreen is a no-no. Now, this is the thing. Um, again, all right. So the process of how the sun works with you is this. The sun kicks out, emits um, UVB. That's what we want. We yeah, want the UVB. Actually does UVA. Right, UVB. but we want the UVB, the right. UVC as well. Right. But we want UVB, right? And your skin processes those UVB rays. And what happens inside you now is that within your cells, within every cell in your body, there's cholesterol, mm. right? Now, cholesterol has been given this bad rep by Western media and by the Western our medicine cholesterol is actually good for you cholesterol is good there's no good cholesterol and bad cholesterol cholesterol is good for you um this cholesterol is then converted by uvb into vitamin d3 not just vitamin d vitamin d3 in particular that vitamin d3 is a hormone that is utilized by your body for antiviral, anti-carcinogen, antibacterial, uh, it repairs your body, it has so many uses, but without cholesterol in your body, forget the sun. So all these statins, you have these uh, medication statins which are um, anti-cholesterol, reduces cholesterol and all that, that's causing, that's wreaking havoc. Mm. And the reason why they're doing that is because of my high blood pressure. It's not the cholesterol that's causing the problem, you know, a lot of us eat table salt. The table salt is scratching up the surface of the blood vessels, causing damage. And then cholesterol actually is a, rep is a repairing mechanism to repair it. The cholesterol goes there and there's also, anytime there's any kind of cell damage or tissue damage, white blood cells will go because they want food. So the cholesterol's there and the white blood cells are mucus and they harden to form plaque, the combination, right? form plaque and that causes atherosclerosis and high blood pressure and that so rather than saying let's get rid of the white blood cells they say oh it's the cholesterol so you know and they got l um l ldl and hdl low density lipids and high density lipids and they say well hdl is good ldl is bad no you know the lipids is what carries the cholesterol around. It's not actually the cholesterol, the lipids. Right. But your lipids are not bad. There's no bad lipids. It's the white blood cells. It's the um, also the foam cells, which are macrophages, which is a form of white blood cell. They perform. They produce foam cells. This hardens, and that's your that's your um, high blood pressure. So Western medicine, you know, in its sick 
thought process says, let's get rid of the cholesterol rather than get rid of the white blood cells. So you getting rid of cholesterol, now you can't process vitamin D3. So you suffer from all these kinds of diseases. And sunblock is what's causing cancer, not the sun. Sunblock is causing that. So hemp oil, hemp seed oil, you know, if anybody out there has any kind of melanoma or whatever, get um, hemp seed oil because it cures. As well as coconut oil. Yeah. Both of them. Both of them are real good, but, you know, hemp is very effective. That's good. All right. Charlene asks, I had fibroids for 15 years now, and I'm on norethinodrome mm -hmm. for four years. What would happen if I, I do the program as far as how much I would uh, bleed out? Bleeding is the major problem with me not pain. Okay, so this is the thing is, you've been on it for four years, how are your fibroids? Are your fibroids gone? Are they still there? I can answer that. You don't, it's a rhetorical question. Your fibroids are still there. You still have the same problems. So all you're doing is like the dam that's holding back the, 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 the gushing water. You're, that medication is acting as a dam. What we're dealing with is we're dealing with, all right, your menorrhagia. Mener, which is excess bleeding, through dealing with your estrogen issue, we're getting rid of the menorrhagia. That's your problem. That, in turn, will get rid of the anemia that you may be suffering because of excessive it's bleeding. Like bleeding yeah. Right? So, our thing is not about, you know, treating and, you know, live with this, you've got to live with your fibroids and here's how you're going to cope. Take this. And, no, we're getting rid of it. We're getting rid of your problem, we, we, you know, or oh, you're getting rid of it. We're giving you the way right. in which to do it. And I think one thing we have to stress is that we have to understand that a fibroid is not just a reproduction issue. Okay, the reproduction system houses or your uterus houses the fibroid. But how that fibroid got there was from another system of the excretory. Your liver was involved. Your endocrine system was involved. Okay, these systems all played a part in producing this fibroid. So the way how AMA is attacking the fibroid, we're not just looking at the reproduction system. We're looking at these other systems that are involved, right. other components. So we're attacking and strengthening the endocrine system, okay, which is produced from the brain, as you know. So there's the hormone section that we have to look at. Then there's the excretory system, which was the liver. And Dr. Amson was going through these and the supplements that help each one of these systems to eliminate the fibroids. And remember, your, your liver, just to, just to um, interject, your liver has its backup components, it has backing signals, that's your kidneys, your gallbladder, your pancreas, your spleen. They all play a major role in how your food is metabolized, what nutrients are then distributed through the portal vein into your system to give nutrient and minerals to wherever. So. Everything is assigned, you know, when you metabolize, out right. goes the vitamins, out goes the minerals and all this. And that was leading me to the point where, you know, depending on where your fibroid is, the uterus could be tilted backwards, so it's leading more onto your, your bowels, so you could be suffering constipation. It could be, you know, it can, the fibroid can tilt it forward slightly, so it's more leaning on the, u the urethra or your, your, um, ur your urine. So you're urinating more. So what I'm saying in a nutshell is that when we attack systematically on how to eliminate your fibroids, we take all components that are involved to address this fibroid because it wasn't just your wound one day went out of whack and here came a fibroid. That was not how the fibroids, you know, is created or how it's developed. And it's not just when we say estrogen is the root cause you know, estrogen is not just produced from the wound. Estrogen comes, travels down to the wound, to the, to the receptors that are there. So we take everything in perspective on how a fibroid or a cyst comes about. Next question. All right, so it's uh, S-L-W-I-M. Uh, so this is green peas allowed. Green peas? Yeah, that's yeah no. No, green peas are they, they're very assy. Um, but you know, we, we the only peas or the lagoons to say that we will uh, recommend are the black lentils or black 
navy beans or black chickpeas and you know what we recommend is that they be soaked for at least um, 24 hours prior to consuming because the water which is soaked in will um, neutralize the nitrogen that they contain okay and now, um, all, all legumes are night what we call nitrogen fixators yeah nitrogen fixators are bacteria that's contained in them and they actually produce nitrogen right they produce nitrogen nitrogen is a toxin in the body that your liver is always trying to get rid of out of the body the more nitrogen you have in your body and remember nitrogen is like 85 percent of our atmosphere so every time we breathe in we're breathing in nitrogen as well as oxygen so our liver has to go to work on that so when we put in excess nitrogen which we're either coming from you know legumes right or alcohol or coffee caffeine right it overworks the liver the liver now is overworked and even though the liver is so powerful and strong because when it starts failing and this is what happens as we get older right the liver becomes overworked and sluggish then the liver is no longer able to um get rid of nitrogen as it should do now comes estrogen now because it's so busy working with the nitrogen trying to get rid of the nitrogen it's allowing estrogen to get into the bloodstream and then when, when the estrogen gets into the bloodstream that's where really the whole phenomena of um fibroids endometriosis you know the fiber the estrogen stagnates around where there's the most receptors now the most there, there's four or five pl places in the body in the female body where there, there are the most estrogen receptors that's in the ovaries in the uterus in the um liver in the breasts in the thyroid and in the brain so a lot of women who get hysterectomies one of the things that happens afterwards that's common is breast cancer because the next um most receptors is in the breasts some women suffer from thyroid issues hi either hyperthyroid which is caused by white blood cells called um thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins right tsi they mimic the hormone thyroid stimulating hormone and get your thyroid hormone to produce t3 and t4 so it starts metabolizing you lose weight and you start getting shakes like graves disease and you can't put on weight every you know you're skinny and you stay skinny and you have violent shakes and shivers convulsions and whatever right because of the estrogen um lowering the charge and then white blood cells attacking then you have hypothyroid i mean hypothyroid where you have um estrogen lowering the charge and then you get these um immunoglobulins which block the receptors for thyroid stimulating hormone so the receptors for the thyroid stimulating hormone which is a natural hormone it can't get to the thyroid so the thyroid doesn't function it doesn't it, it's like well we're waiting on the the brain or the hypothalamus to tell us to um produce thyroid hormone and we're never getting a signal so if so we don't get the signal a fake signal that no, is already getting produced no 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 it the, the thyroid with, with hypothyroid it's actually just blocking the receptors oh, yeah, sorry. right so there's no metabolism so you're not metabolizing as you should do you're not um burning energy so therefore you gain weight and you oh, i'm not eating anything for two days you still gain weight so you start gaining 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 so by eliminating the um the estrogen we're protecting the thyroid by eliminating the white blood cells we're protecting the thyroid you know so i well, hope we've answered that question okay so saga has a question uh what about your roommate and she asked uh and would this diet be the same for men who are trying to stay healthy or are there other fruits and vegetables men should all right let me see that because you should said a word there that um, what about which one you hear for me oh yeah oh yerba mint mm -hmm. i mean yerba mint is okay we ain't something that we're going to turn around and say to you you know that's bad for you yerba mint is okay um 
There are, but this is the thing. Here's what one of the problems that we find when we're doing when we've been doing our research on who else is treating fibroids and whatever out there. What we find is somebody will say to you, get Vitex or get Yerbamin, and it's like this one thing or this. We have found all these different herbs. Red clover, people. You know, a lot, a lot of people say red clover. Red clover actually is highly estrogenic, mm. right? But a lot of people say one thing. I'll say, take this or take that. Yeah, let me get a yoga make tea or let me get Vitex and whatever. This is one thing. We're dealing with, no, we need to bombard absolutely all the things which inhibit estrogen and help a healthy hormonal balance. We're, bomb we're, we're, we're putting that into a concentrated, into concentrated formulas, you know, so we might have Vitex in, 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 in our formula, but it's also coupled with, you know, ashwagandha, things which bring out the most effective or more, most potent form of these, um, you know, these herbs, these minerals. Like we just nutrients. said, you know, like we just said, when you, when you address in, um, a condition, you've ne you're never addressing one component. Right. You're never addressing one component. So, you know, one herb or one supplement or one tea, you know, is not going to resolve it. You know, I've, I've, I've seen even with these uh, noni eggs that women have. Oh, and yoni. Yoni, yoni, eggs. yoni eggs. Sorry, I do apologize. Yoni eggs. And yeah, they might clean out the uterus, the wound. Women might be having excellent results in that, but it's not attacking the whole problem. It's a temporary fix. And this is why we're more successful than any other, you know, organization or um, group or individual that's working on the fibroid or the female reproduction system. Because we understand that that might be the ending place or particular system where the problem is taking place. But there's other counterparts that are playing a role to why you're suffering from that condition. Like what we went through, the liver is very important. Right. The liver is so important. The second you know, part, the, your endocrine system, your endocrine system right. is, you know, that is, that is the be all and end all. That's how your body communicates. Like when there's an issue or not, this is your body communicating and the disruption of your body's communication and it communicates through chemicals. It's electrochemical communication. You have nerves with elect electrical signals, right? And also, you know, I didn't say what well, part of cholesterol. Cholesterol is the myelin sheath that's around your nerves. That's also cholesterol. So when you get rid of cholesterol, that's, you know, you got, now you've got nervous disorders. Now you've got Parkinson's. Um, you got, you know, we spoke about um, the, the seizures and that. These are all down to white blood cells and whatever estrogen disrupting your cholesterol, disrupting things because they remove, they, they, it strips away. It's a catabolic steroid. Steroids mean it's like amplification of a situation. So catabolism is to break things down. So mm -hmm. estrogen breaks you down. So all these components like the yoni eggs, yes, may have temporary effectiveness, but it's not going to address your kidney. It's not going to address your liver. It's not going to address your blood. You see what I'm saying? Right. So it's not going to address your endocrine glands within your brain. It's not going to address your hypothalamus, pineal your gland. pituitary gland, your right. pineal gland, pineal gland. It's not going to address any of those. So what we're dealing with is like the whole body. And I think the second part of this question was, does the same nutrition diet for women have the same effect for men? Is that, is that yeah, something like that? Yeah, if you want to stay healthy or... You yes, the first absolutely. Uh, this, the, the, the meal guides that we put together, or the nutrition guides that we have, or the class A, B or C diet, is for men, unisex, men and male and female. Because how estrogen is affecting us as males is prostate cancer. Okay, that's, that's one of the main cause for men having prostate cancer. It's also being estrogen dominant. So you have the females with the fibroids, cysts, we got men with erection deficiencies and also prostate cancer. So and also um um oligo um oligospermia right and azospermia oligospermia and azospermia. These are I don't know if I said it right because right but basically right? It's low sperm. But oligospermia 
is basically low sperm count. Right. As with sperm, your means you're not producing sperm anymore. Right. These are all, and this, you know, there's a combination, you know. And the thing is, is like estrogen is the major, is a major part. But then you have things like THC, like men who smoke weed a lot. Yes, that's what right? I was gonna say. You might hate us now, man. <laughs> we're men who smoke weed, smoke yes, a whole bunch of weed, right? Yeah. Major issue, you know, you 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 you're drying out, you're rotting out your balls, son. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not <laughs> I mean no basically, good. sisters and brothers, you know, um, you gotta leave those trees alone. It's when you're smoking. Yeah, See, exactly. hemp, weed, cannabis, or hemp, it's great. One of the most powerful medicinal herbs on the planet is hemp, cannabis, marijuana, most powerful. But when you smoke it, you're producing polyhydrocarbons which is the most toxic substance on the planet there's THC which is what gives you the high but THC wreaks havoc in the body mm. so you know you've got now you've got these different strains of of, of um, weed yeah. where they, you know it's genetically modified so you got somebody who's oh I'm an herb man you know you got these raster man you know people yeah, that, I'm an herb 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 but it's Natural genetically man. modified That's now being put out there they've increased you know you know um, Western scientists mad scientists they're like well what creates the high THC well if what happens when we increase the THC they'll get a better high but what else happens is that your balls are shrivelling up right the calm down. What they call when you come down from that. It's funny when we say your balls when we're doing that, right? Well, you did that. You did that. that. I saw you that too. You know, he did that. So, (laughs) next question. All right, so she's hot pink. She asks, what is considered normal levels of testosterone, uh, estrogen, and uh, progesterone? Well, one thing we'll say is that we want estrogen eliminated out of the body, period. It's not the natural hormone that a woman or female hormone that a a woman should have. She wants to have, you know, some level of testosterone and the main hormone that she wants to govern her body is, is the progesterone, okay? And vice versa with the man, the main... Right, that and also the levels are, are determined by, you know, your body weight, your... Your, your um, body mass. Your body mass, your, um, your ethnicity. Yep. Um, all of those things come into, uh, come into being, but... One thing for men, I would say, yeah. um, if you're not waking up, up, all right? If you're not waking up, up in the morning, that's the first sign that your testosterone is low. And we're talking about natural testosterone and right. natural progesterone, not progestin, not anabolic steroids that you may inject this, or whatever. Not this because one the, the problem, that I said right, now. the problem when you have synthesized and uh, you know, people are taking steroids, you know, these steroids from animal origins, right? right whatever. No, we're not going to give you steroids. What we're doing, we're giving you herbs, minerals and nutrients, which promote in your body natural production. So there's no overproduction. One of the problems with men who are bodybuilders, they're high, they have high levels of testosterone, but the levels of testosterone is like a thousand times it's supposed to be natural. So the, the brain is like, well, we're under attack of testosterone. Let's cut off our um, production of natural testosterone. So we're the testicles, yeah. which produces the testosterone, they're like, all right, we're shutting down. We're not needed. And then you have shrinkage of the um, male reproductive, the phallus and of the testicles. And erectile dysfunction comes with that. And azospermia comes as a result of that. So... You know, natural production. Your body has, you, you know, your your endocrine system knows when to shut something off, knows when to turn it, switch it on, yeah, and switch it off. Switch off, switch off. Right, and you need. You, that's what we're trying to balance within you. You know, and and by the correct diet and supplementation, it's balancing you. What we call homeostasis, the balance of your whole system. All right. Okay. So. Oh, Nicole asks, my husband suffers from excessive mucus. He blows his nose about 50 times a day. He also has a mild sleep apnea. Do you have any info on this? Well, let's look at what he's eating. What, you know, what is the food that he's consuming? Does he eat a lot of cheese? Does he drink milk? Does he eat meat? 
wheat, rice, uh, wheat, rice, all of these diet. You remember? Starchiness. No condition. Well, let me rephrase that. Sorry. Every condition, every health condition, um, even the one that the young lady just explained from her husband that he's suffering from, is caused by what the intake of your food, what you eat. There's no way around it. Okay. You're not just going to walk down the road and a virus hits you like that, like we see in the movies or whatever, or mucus just comes out. No. It's what he's eating, okay? Is he drinking enough water? Is he exercising? All right? So, well, you know, let me correct you.